Australia is facing some big dilemmas, living with COVID, our tough stance on China and tackling climate change. How are we faring on the world stage? Welcome to Q&A. A lovely welcome. I'm Stan Grant. It's terrific to be with you live from the Canberra Theatre. So great to have so many of you here in the room and a warm welcome to those who've travelled from regional areas as well to join in the discussion. Great panel tonight. Let's see who's with us. Epidemiologist Kamalini Lukuge, President of the Australian Medical Association, Omar Korshid, Pitnajara woman from the Uluru Statement Leadership Group, Sally Scales, Economist and Research Fellow Cameron Murray, and political and international editor, Peter Harcher. Please make them all feel welcome. And you can stream us live on iView and, of course, all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. We'd love you to join the debate from home as well. Our first question comes from Brian Chen. What do you think Australia's process to return to normalcy, if it happens at all, will look like? Omar, when do we get back to normal, if at all? Uh, thank you, Brian. Well, haven't we seen extraordinary change uh, in this country and around the world as a result of this pandemic? And if we look uh, back on history, we will see that uh, the virus is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. The last one, the, the great Spanish flu, went around the world for over 50 years. So we do have to learn how to live with COVID. Step one, we've all got to be vaccinated. That's pretty clear. And not just Australians. One day, our little bubble's going to burst and we're going to have to join the rest of the world. So there's a really big priority, not just for them, but for us, for the whole world to deal with this. It is a global challenge. That means getting those vaccines out to every single country in the world. Every single person in the world has got to get access because without that, we're going to see new variants, more challenging situations, and it's going to be really, really hard to live with the virus. Omar, vaccine, of course, has been on everyone's mind, and there's been a lot of questions raised about the speed of the rollout. If we, I think, according to the current seven-day averages, if we stay at this pace, it'll be a year before we get to the point where we need to be. And especially we're talking about the most vulnerable as well, the people that were in the first category. Is there a necessity to look at, at compulsory vaccine, at least in some cases? Well, Stan, there are some circumstances where we believe uh, compulsory vaccines should be considered, but, but for the most part, uh, I think Australians believe in vaccination. We have extraordinary vaccination success uh, in our history. We've got 95% compliance with our childhood vaccination program, so we know we believe in vaccines, uh, and we just need to keep up the job of rolling out this vaccine. Uh, we know that if... Uh, if we get the vaccines into the country, we'll get the program done. And we're looking forward to it being complete uh, by the end of the year. Camelini, when we even use this word normal, is there a new definition of what normal is going to look like? Look, I think I agree with everything Omar said, but I'd like to follow up on one thing around mandatory vaccination. I think the situation with aged care workers, before I answer mm. your question, mm. uh, is a really good example of the fact that we've succeeded so far with COVID because we've supported our community to engage and do what is right for them and what is right for us in broader public health terms. And uh, it, it's incomprehensible to me that until a couple of weeks ago, aged care workers were not even being vaccinated when residents were being vaccinated. Uh, until a couple of weeks ago, we didn't know how many of them were vaccinated we, and we hadn't even thought to ask the question. And from that, we go straight to maybe we should force them to get vaccinated. We know most aged care workers want to get vaccinated. So before we go to that, maybe we should think about the fact that that, that employers, age, everybody, multiple reviews have agreed that they're underpaid. If we're going to ask them to get vaccinated because it's right for us and it's right for them as employees, maybe we should pay them. If we can't get the vaccine into aged care facilities, maybe we should pay them to go mm. to vaccine centres. Maybe we should pay them for a couple of days off if, they have, if they're not feeling well after the vaccine. We need to think about those things before we go to extremes. And Often what I hear, what I've, I've done, I've worked on pandemics for two and a half decades. Mm. 
if you go to those extremes, we controlled Ebola without ever making Ebola vaccination uh, mandatory. Because you, you worked on Ebola. I've worked on multiple mm. Ebola outbreaks, including the last one when towards the end we had vaccines. And what we know is you only succeed in controlling these types of diseases if the community is a respected partner and with you. And the way governments, you know, people with political economic power achieve that is by supporting the community and to engage, not lecturing them and not forcing them to do things. I think uh, you and I think, Stan, the, the, the thing actually that's been missing from the public debate is the fact that the need for vaccination is not just to protect you as an individual, mm. not all about I want to be safe, it's actually about protecting the vulnerable in our community, other people. We are all in this together and, uh, and I think what will help the community understand uh, the importance of vaccination if we get that message out there. This is our collective fight. We've got to do it together. Sally, among the most vulnerable, of course, are Indigenous communities. We've seen an extraordinary response to this, and you were you were involved in it. I, I don't need to tell you. But what does a post-COVID or, a, or a <coughs> living with COVID or a COVID normal look like for Indigenous communities? Well, my hope is that we don't go back to the normal complacency around Aboriginal health and Aboriginal outcomes. Um, you know, COVID's sh truly shown the good and the bad and the ugly of how quickly, um, you know, state, local governments and organisations can rally and do what they need to do. I mean, for us in APY, we started having restrictions about um, who could enter into APY back in February last year. I mean, and that was before COVID was fully in Australia and before we were having discussions around it. So, you know, and we've seen the huge dedication that on the ground Aboriginal communities have to protecting its, you know, vulnerable people. And that is the age and that is the young. And whether it is um, closing the community off, you know, making sure that, you know, asking visitors not to come through. You know, what happened with this, the Victorian couple is you know, those communities are at risk now. So it's, but all the communities were saying is like, and this is a great showing of when you give Aboriginal people the right to, to self-determination, give them the control, we've seen how we do it well. You know, we've kept COVID out of Aboriginal communities. And so my hope is listen to us, continue to listen to us. A, let's, you know, go to a referendum and, you know, put in all the statement from the heart and also listen to us to make sure that we keep this going mm. and let's not go back to the complacency of Aboriginal issues. You mentioned complacency. You've also mentioned the Melbourne couple as well. Um, that brings in our next question. It comes from Tilly Dickinson. Tilly? As exemplified by the recent instance of a Melbourne couple crossing the Queensland border despite their home city being under lockdown, do you think the average Australian has become COVID complacent because the ongoing pandemic is no longer something that the majority experience in their day-to-day -day lives? And do you think that this complacency is being fueled by the Scott Morrison government's notably slow vaccine rollout? Peter Harcher. Well, Tilly, I'd say that uh, Australians have got pretty comfortable. We've been pretty privileged uh, to be able to pretty much, uh, Melbourne accept, Victoria accepted um, particularly, pretty much live lives as normal, with the exception of international contacts, of course. And I think the combination of uh, that fortunate position that uh, we find ourselves in because of the rigorous early public health response has not only made us all feel pretty comfortable with our lives, uh, but it has injected a sort of sluggishness, I think, in the, into the, some of the rates of take-up of vaccinations, and we saw how quickly that changed when there was... A, the latest scare in Victoria, a, a surge of people getting vaccination. But the real, the real uh, complacency, I would suggest, um, comes from the top. We saw, you know, credit where it's due, the initial response, I think the public health response and the economic stimulus um, was exemplary, was textbook stuff. But when that first wave uh, of emergency and crisis faded, I think what we saw was um, the return to the Australia's greatest enemy, uh, our natural complacency. So, uh, and as a function of that, because of the, the slowness of the vaccine uh, rollout, the inability to move away from a, a flawed system of hotel quarantine, we've seen the states impatient uh, stepping up increasingly to take over from the federal government tasks that the federal government had been doing. So, um, I, 
I think we I think we've been comfortable, and the government has been complacent. Cameron Murray, um, is complacency the word you would use? Uh, I think people are, are right to be complacent because I think compared to what we see in the media, uh, I think people have a better judge of the risks than what we've seen in the media. And uh, from a public health perspective, it's, it's not clear to me that any of our reactions have been ideal. I've read the pandemic plans from prior to 2020 and most of what we've done, we're not in them. School closures were not recommended. Um, work, working from home, not recommended. Border closures, not recommended. Um, we know this, um, this virus is a thousand times worse for elderly people than the young. And we don't need to vaccinate 100% of the young people before we open up. That's just uh, an imbalance of risks. Cameron, That's are, just... you, are, you, are you seriously suggesting that uh, COVID doesn't affect young people or, or that... Our no. border closures haven't been haven't made us almost the most successful country in the world when it's come to managing this pandemic. Do you think we've been the most successful? I think we've been extraordinarily successful. In what you, measure? You, you, you look at the number of people who've actually in died all public from health, COVID. in all public health, in all the delayed births, all those couples who will never have the children they want because they uh, hospitals were delayed. They were they were scared of the pandemic. All those routine health checks that got delayed that we can't catch up on. You, you think that they outweigh the risks I, I'm sorry, and justify. I'm sorry, Cameron, but <laughs> if you look at the data from every country that didn't do those things, all of that happened, plus a lot of people died of COVID. How so, many? How many? So, uh, um, but, I, you know, I, I've talked... But let's be serious. Stan You're sitting here saying we should vaccinate 100% of people before we open borders. We know, <laughs> or some large portion, and we're talking about making this compulsory when we know that children have extremely low risks. We know that schools were open for the 18 months in Sweden and no children died. Like, this seems to me like a complete imbalance and a, and a sort of rejection of public health messaging of maximising total health and total well-being. Can, can do, I speak as a public health expert um, yeah. and not an economist? I think well, that... So, what we are aiming for is a level of vaccine coverage that means yeah. we are not going to get to high levels of transmission and yep. be constantly... Uh, so, so, what is that? ..following our towel. If you look at what's happening in the UK at the moment, they have almost 50% coverage and they started to open up they opened up to other countries in Europe. They've now had to close to Portugal. Their Prime Minister, their, uh, their uh, Secretary of um, Economic, the Treasury, has said we may need to delay opening up because we've got a new yeah. variant, we've got an increase in hospitalizations, we've got an increased number of cases. So I think waiting a few months to get to a level of vaccine coverage where we know we can control mm -hmm. this disease mm -hmm. without stringent measures, it just is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've, I've really had issues with during this pandemic is people without the appropriate expertise making commentary. Our public, our I public just, I trust look, far more than many of the other experts who I've can, seen on can, TV. Can, can, I just can you, can you hold, hold the thoughts for a moment, Cameron? Yeah. Because it does lead to our next question. I do want to come okay. back in and pick this up with you, but Annabelle Howard will, will uh, I think also, is looking at this issue about just how seriously we should take this. I'm originally from Sydney and moved to Canberra just before COVID hit last year. And living in Canberra, there hasn't been a COVID case in around a year. Do you agree with the belief that Australia's COVID precautions have been overly cautious? Okay, I'll, I'll go to Canberra. <laughs> well, I mean, firstly, I don't appreciate the, the, the you know, academic barbs about specialties because I know you're, you routinely comment on, on economic policy issues. But, <laughs> like... You're all clapping for her. I think we should be fair about this. Um, but, look, I've read the pandemic response plans. Now, either we were wrong prior to 2020 and we made ridiculous plans, or we're wrong now. We can't both be right. W w was the point here, Cameron, that it was, some, it was novel? It was changing. Even now we're seeing new strains coming in. So that's, this is something we've had to respond viruses. to in, I, real, I... in real time. I'll see from Cameron we... and then... This is true and predictable, and I, I, I wrote six months ago that this virus will mutate, 
we'll see new strains and we'll find reasons to panic again. And this was known, correct, that this would happen. We have medical experts who would have known this. So, you know, I, I think we, we're more than a year into this. We have thousands of Australians who can't cross the border and come home. We're closing down routinely our normal health services. And I think it's time to ask questions about the balance of risk and reward from the response we've I'll, had. And I'll, I think that's I'll just totally reasonable. Sally, Sally had a hand up and all. Um, for me, I would say, Cameron, that I will always be cautious when, when I'm a part of a group that is always going to be vulnerable, where Aboriginal people have got underlying issues. I'm always going to caution and make sure that we are protecting our elderly, we are yep. protecting... It's a luxury but to not be cautious. So, so if, like you're assuming this, the someone, effectiveness of what Cameron, we're doing, let me finish. Right? Let me finish. <laughs> if COVID got into an Aboriginal community, we don't have the luxury of quarantining by ourselves. In a household, there is nothing as 2.2 people living in one house. You are, there's multiple people living in homes. And also, we don't get... It for, for my communities, if we had a COVID out there, everyone would have it within a day. And there'll be so, like a, a turnaround for the Royal Flying Doctors is eight hours to Alice Springs or to Adelaide. Now that, in a c case if someone else gets COVID and is a vulnerable person, they're gonna die before that plane comes back. So for me, I'm always gonna be cautious. I'm always gonna make sure, let's protect our elderly, let's protect our vulnerable people, and it's everyone's job to do that. And I, it is gonna, and I'm gonna, if every time there's a new strain, I will keep saying that because it's, I'm not gonna mess around with people's lives. Look, we had experiments in the past of isolating groups. We had cruise ships get COVID and they were very vulnerable people. So we know what the data is, and it's not everyone gets everything. We know here we've had the AMA head telling us it's time to live with COVID, basically. Okay, it's time, if, if, it is uh, time well, to live with COVID. I should be able to talk for myself. I yes. don't think it's time to live with COVID right now. It's time to finish the job. Uh, What's, can you the, define that? Because I feel like we've, we haven't we, had a we plan. We've got no end game. Vaccines available to every Australian who wants one. We haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a way to go before we've done uh, the job. And to go back to the actual question, uh, have we overshot? No, we haven't because we have protected our people in a way that very few other countries have done. We've seen overseas first world countries turn into third world countries. Their healthcare system is completely not seen that. overwhelmed. Can, 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 I, can I bring Peter Hartree on this? Peter, um, were we actually, and it looks this way now in retrospect, um, really looking at an elimination strategy? Uh, and was that the right way to go? And is there a risk that we end up now being left behind as the borders remain closed, as states close their borders, as we see more lockdowns, while the rest of the world is, in fact, living with it as they roll out more vaccines? Well, Stan, let me say first that I'm very uh, disturbed by Cameron's notion that we should be constrained uh, by lack of expertise. That would be terrible for my career. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I, I just want to um, take a deep breath and, <laughs> and get on with it. Um, Look, we, val the... we value what you bring, Peter. Well, thank you, Stan. And as a fellow journalist, <laughs> let, me the, let me return the compliment. But um, uh, look, one of the dilemma, one of, the, one of the, uh, the dichotomies that Australia has struggled with from the beginning with this thing, is that um, last April, when the national cabinet put out a formal statement of, poli of Australian uh, unified national policy on this, it said that the national cabinet would pursue a suppression slash eradication strategy. Now, that's interesting because they're two different things. Mm. Um, suppression is what Scott Morrison has consistently articulated from the beginning, is the strategy. The states, however, uh, through their actions, have been avidly pursuing an eradication strategy. So where Scott Morrison says, um, no, you, you shouldn't be so quick to shut your state borders, the states shut their borders anyway. And that, that is a clash, uh, um, a tension that has never really been settled. Um, so we, that, that, that explains a lot of the it, it's, it's been the settled mismatch. somewhere. It's actually yeah. been settled at the ballot box. We well, have no, seen well, it. Yeah. And, and it, has been a very, it has been a very popular measure. It's been yeah. It has been a very popular, popular measure. That's right. so, safe. But does that then, Peter, that, mm. that political outcome yeah. also muddy the waters, that yes, there are political it, it calculations being it, made. It, it did, and it's, it, it helps explain 
why the federal government was uh, relatively relaxed and pretty slow about mm. the vaccine rollout. It's why Australia today, so 18% of Australians uh, on the last stats I saw a couple of days ago have had at least one jab. That ranks Australia 63rd in the world, 63rd. So because we were uh, doing so well, we've then done not so well. Mm. And to your question, Stan, does that risk us becoming uh, what Innes Willocks from the Australian Industry mm. Group has called a gilded cage, where it's gilded with lots of government uh, debt and public funding, but it's a cage where we can't leave. It was just yesterday, actually, a, a foreign diplomat said to me, uh, people from her particular country are shocked that they can't come to Australia to do business, that, in her words, people are eventually just going to start forgetting about Australia. And um, other, other countries are resuming contact in a way that, that we are not, and we will be coming from behind. Before, before we move to our next question, could I, I just, you know, just pick up on something yep. um, Cameron said there and go to you, Cameron Leedy, on this. This has been a very emotional time, understandably, and you see deaths and you look overseas and you see what's happening in places like India. Um, we see new variants. It is something we don't know a lot about and we're collecting data on the run. But I'm just wondering whether, and I think this is something that Cameron and others have raised, whether the response is driven more by the fear or the reality of the numbers? It's driven by the rea reality of the disease, Dan. So what we know is that uh, one case can go to an uncontrollable uh, outbreak. And so at the moment, we do not have enough people vaccinated to be confident that we can allow the disease to spread without it getting to a point where we need to lock down. And what we have experienced again and again, and what every country that has had transmission has experienced, is this rolling lockdowns. And if you think about places like Europe, places like the US, developed wealthy countries, that's been their experience for the last year and a half in and out of lockdown. Now, we have the way out. We have high vaccine coverage. And I think that just to, it's almost an argument that, um, you know, people, are, Australians are not getting vaccinated because they haven't experienced the horrors of an overwhelming pandemic, overflowing hospitals, overflowing cemeteries. So perhaps we've failed. We've succeeded. We're well ahead of mm. everybody else. OK, okay Look, Cameron, just a final quick word and then we'll yeah. move on. The vaccine was a stroke of luck, let's be honest. What was your plan if there was no vaccine for another two years? So, so I'd really now. like to address really quickly, that really, really quickly. Uh, it's, it's the 1918... Oh, Cameron, please just yeah. let Cameron... It's, it's 1918 thinking, so I think that did inform some of our prior uh, pandemic planning too. Uh, the fact is, the influenza pandemic that everyone keeps referring to happened more than 100 years ago. It happened directly after one of the most traumatic events in history, World War I. Mm. And it was in a time when we, our biomedical research, our health systems were a rudimentary at best. We are in yeah. a different situation. And I had every expectation that we would have vaccines. Okay, what we see is that if you invest... Can, can, we, can I stop you? Because you're actually um, uh, introducing... <laughs> this is a very organic discussion. It's leading from <laughs> one question to another here. And actually, I think, Garrett, Garrett uh, Smith, you also have a question that goes specifically to this point, right? Yeah, exactly. No, I <laughs> was, um, was going to point back to uh, Omar having brought it up at the beginning. But um, <laughs> I have heard that the... From a medical point of view, the comparison can be a little bit misleading and a bit overdone. Um, but there have been striking similarities between the social impacts and the human society impacts of the 1918 flu and of COVID-19. Uh, for example, the more vir virulent um, second wave, um, the relative, uh, in quotation marks, success of um, Australia and the Australian government's response. Um, but I was wondering, uh, what lessons do you think that Australians and the Australian government has learnt from the 1918 flu, and what didn't we learn? Cameron, if you want to finish that, and then I'll quick, quick one from you, Omar. So, I think, uh, <laughs> look, again, I come back to, it was 100 years ago, right? We've, we've dealt with pandemics uh, much more recently, Ebola and these... Uh, are the core components of our successful response. Community-based surveillance, upstream, downstream contact tracing, community engagement in response, social mobilisation restrictions. Uh, I, I 
I work on these because I've dealt with pandemics recently. They've been core to our response. I think what we need to learn from 1918 is that, again, the community is always the one that, that will solve these pandemics, mm. and we need to support them. Places that had poor living conditions, where people had no autonomy, were the hardest hit. And, you know, we brought in economic measures to support people to engage in the public health response. Uh, that's where I think the government has learned, has applied those lessons. We need to continue doing that, as uh, Sally said. Uh, I'm a, one of the lessons is that it sticks around for a very long time. I think the 1918 flu was around for another 50 years. So it was living with it as well, wasn't it? Which is what we're facing now. Uh, we are facing that. I think there's some other lessons, though. Uh, before we had vaccines, we actually fell back on some pretty old-fashioned uh, uh, social distancing and measures that would have been used uh, in, the, um, in the, the, the influenza pandemic, the great, uh, that great pandemic. Uh, but it's the preparation that we've been doing, uh, it's the science that has been uh, being developed around vaccines around our last few pandemics, SARS and MERS, they weren't really pandemics, but epidemics, and of course Ebola. Uh, the technology that was developed to treat uh, those conditions to create vaccines has, has been very quickly modified. And that's how we've been able to get here. It's through science. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually uh, the other lesson I think the government has taken on. They've trusted scientists, which is something that uh, really, we've really lost as a community. They've trusted medical expertise. We've seen governments making decisions they would never have believed they would mm -hmm. make. Mm -hmm. Shutting down borders, paying everybody not to go to work. I mean, these are things that Scott Morris would never have believed he'd be doing uh, when he won the last election. Uh, and yet it's been done because it was advised by the experts and by scientists. And that is the lesson that we've got to take forward to trust science, trust the experts. Uh, and, and we will win as a society if we do that. <laughs> our, our next question comes from Tiki Medcraft-Smith. Yeah, hi. Um, as an Aboriginal woman, I've got a pretty acute awareness of the vulnerabilities of our communities, but I'm also a mother of four kids. So I've got a pretty cute, uh, good idea of uh, the super spreaders that our kids are. Now, I understand that, uh, you know, they don't seem to be affected as badly um, by COVID, but I also understand that uh, they're not as aware of self-hygiene. Um, I know not one of my kids knows how to cough and sneeze into his elbow, no matter how many times we tell him. You know, we live in multi-generational families. They're interacting inside and outside of the home. You know, should we really be considering uh, vaccinating kids and young kids? Sally, are you looking at this with your own communities that you're involved in? And what's your attitude to, to vaccinating children? Well, so one of the things that we know is when it's a community-controlled, so Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations, they've done an incredible job with vaccinations in the community. Um, you know, so there's been huge numbers of people going and getting vaccinated. Um, at the Congress in Alice Springs even had so much vaccines that they opened it up to the non-Indigenous population in Alice Springs. Um, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to the health organisations that are run by government, um, especially the, you know, state and territories, they're not even going out to our remote communities um, or the people are still waiting. I mean, look... As soon as it's possible, I would like to vaccinate my child. I think it's really important that we can do that. Um, but as Omar has been saying, it's, you know, this is a time to be trusting doctors and scientists. So, you know, that's where we need to be listening to. And I know kids are super spreaders. Um, they, every time a child goes to, one child has um, a flu in childcare, everyone tends to have it. So I think it's, we need to look at all of that. And it's all about protecting our communities, our most vulnerable. P Peter Hatcher, one of the issues here as well has been the different approaches from different states. And even now where it comes to who gets access to what vaccine, what the ages are, even when it comes to children, there are differences. Again, how does that affect a national rollout and, and, and factoring political calculations into that? Well, it's been... Um, uh, it's, it, it's contributed to the scrappiness of the whole thing, uh, of course. And so we see things like... Uh, for example, why has it taken this long before we're getting serious about pharmacists being able to give people vaccinations? Well, part of it was a delay to get everybody trained, and that's normal and understandable. But now some states have already started using pharmacists, and others aren't even talking about it. So, I mean, you get, you get that sort of uh, scrappiness and lumpiness, and then you get competitive parochialism, where mm. premiers enjoy 
<laughs> you know, I remember a, a very, um, uh, when I was watching um, Queensland's uh, premier Pal uh, very ostentatiously uh, savouring the words when she was saying, we're going to slam the border shut to shut out the Southerners. <laughs> and all the, all the Queenslanders were cheering her on. So you get that sort of um, uh, exuberant parochialism that did interrupt a lot of commerce and a lot of uh, family lives and family plans. And it, you did wonder uh, whether some of it was just a little bit too exuberant. Cameron. I think it's Im important to, to point out, though, that a lot of people have been uh, worried about our slow vaccine rollout. But the reality is we have been limited uh, right from the start by supply. That has been right at the core of the speed of our rollout. Uh, we were three million doses down right at the very start and we, we had to wait until our local production got going. Then, of course, we hit uh, the, the roadblock from the Atagi decision around TTS. That was another uh, blow to the system and it, we had to react to that. Um, GPs have been at the core of the rollout. They've been really successful and they've rolled out uh, over three million uh, of the five and a half million doses uh, so far. And they are the ones who are managing to convince hesitant people to actually go out and get the vaccine because they know their patients, they are trusted by their patients. So what we need to do going forward is make sure that we've got uh, the right number of distribution points for the number of vaccines we've got. And that's why we haven't gone to pharmacists because we just don't have the vaccines yet. That may change later in the year, but for now we've got to rely uh, on our GPs, on our mass vaccination centres, uh, on our respiratory clinics, and on people to start doing the right thing, rolling up their sleeves and getting their vaccine. Cameron? I have no idea why oh. we're vaccinating kids. I mean, it's a seriously very mild in kids. Give me some information that says otherwise, because I've been reading everything I can and it makes no sense to me. I can tell you a little bit about kids. Yep. Uh, so kids uh, actually don't catch COVID as much. Uh, that is one of the realities, so that's true. However, uh, if they do get it, they, they certainly don't follow the rules, as, as the question yeah. uh, pointed out. And uh, unfortunately, with the latest uh, variants, we are now starting to see children getting sick and ending up in hospital with COVID. And children have died uh, from this virus around the How? world. So we yeah. will need to get there at some point. But I can tell you now that the scientists, the Atagi experts that make these decisions will not recommend this vaccine for children until there is a direct benefit not just for the community, but for the children themselves. They're not going to vaccinate kids to protect us or older Australians. They're only going to vaccinate kids if it's good for the children themselves. Our next question comes from Tam Goddard. Good evening. I realise that our relationship with China is complex and fraught, which requires constant balancing, rebalancing and fine-tuning. However, um, do you think that Scott Morrison wants to bring China issue to the forefront of the G7 meeting this week for political reasons more than genuine national interest. And may I add, please, if one is cynical, then one would think that by bringing up the China issue, he hopes to distract G7 focus on Australia's woeful, woeful climate change stance and, of course, placed to domestic politics. Thank you. Thank you, Tan. Peter Harsha. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Tan. 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 Um, well, let me begin by saying uh, the G7 doesn't require, I don't think, Scott Morrison to alarm them about uh, the state of China relations. You remember Donald Trump uh, was a very outspoken um, and very aggressive uh, confronter of China, trade sanctions all over the place, horrible, horrible uh, accusatory rhetoric and all the rest of it. So, uh, and Joe Biden, uh, although he's dropped the uh, tone of the rhetoric, has persisted absolutely with a confrontational stance with China. And if you look around the table at the G7, uh, every leader there, every country at the G7, has some sort of problem with China at the moment. Uh, you know, the European uh, leaders, the European Parliament has said they're going to refuse to ratify a new investment agreement with China. Um, the Japanese um, are having near daily incursions into their uh, contested airspace with, with China and are extremely uh, anxious about, and, and so on, around the, around the table. And the Canadians have got, they're in a situation with China very similar to Australia's. Almost every country there 
uh, has the same, same problem. So it doesn't need Mor Morrison to animate them to get, get, to get active on the China question. Uh, uh, however, uh, does Scott Morrison want to use the opportunity for, for Australia and for himself to elevate China as a joint issue? Does he want to bring all the G7 countries and the whole world together to try to balance against uh, the, the sort of economic coercion that China's practicing against Australia? Absolutely he does. How much of that is political? How much of that is in the national interest? I can't see into his, into his mind, which is probably a good thing, and <laughs> I can't see into his heart, but I think you'd, you'd, be, you'd be hard pressed uh, to say that there is no national interest element in what he's doing. Uh, not only is the coalition fully in favor of all the substantive policy that the federal government is running on China, but the Labor Party is as well. These are all national positions, whether it's the Huawei ban, the foreign interference and espionage laws, uh, and so on and so on. Labor is four square with the federal government on all of that, and the only real difference is on the rhetoric. So uh, I don't think that it's a purely uh, cynical political calculation, and Scott Morrison will be criticised for his climate change. <laughs> uh, he'll be singled out at G7 for uh, being a, a real foot dragger on climate change, um, regardless of any discussions about China. <laughs> P Peter, when it, when it comes uh, to China, is there... Well, I want to get your assessment on how you believe this is being handled politically. We've heard the talk of the drumbeats of war. We saw mm. um, the call for a, an inquiry into the origins of COVID, and we saw a retaliation uh, from China um, to that. Are we getting the balance of standing up for Australia's sovereign interests while also being able to navigate what is a, a very complex relationship effectively? The Australian government responses, I think, have been uh, very uh, reactive, where it's detected some sort of pressure or intrusion from China and has acted in response. It hasn't been proactive. You know, Australia, like most democracies, we're not looking for, for trouble, right? We just want to enjoy ourselves and be left alone. Um, so it's been it's been reactive. Not not all democracies throughout history. Not all democracies that throughout, throughout history. No, that's absolutely true. But in, Australia wasn't looking for a fight here. Um, and so, uh, and let, let, let me let me say, by the way, that one of the national interests, one of the, the core national equities that Australia does have to protect here. Uh, is the 1.3 million Australian Chinese Chinese Australian community, which is a core national asset. Mm. Uh, one of the things that uh, we that both Morrison and the Labor Party have done pretty well is uh, is speak in defence of the uh, Chinese Australian community, and we can and should do much more. Um, there's a lot more to be done uh, with on the anti-discrimination uh, side, for example. So that's a that's a core interest we've got to protect, uh, but. In general, um, I think the federal government has been protecting mm -hmm. the substantive interests. The rhetoric can be a little overheated, but you know, I, I haven't even been terribly critical of the government on that, and here's why. Because if you've been listening to the rhetoric that's been coming out of China for, well, ever since Xi Jinping took power, uh, he stands up month after month, year after year, in front of troops, visits every military base in China, dresses in military uh, fatigues, stands in front of the troops, and his standard line is always, uh, you must prepare to fight and win wars. Now, if that's not the drums of war, I don't know what yeah. is. C can I bring Cameron in? Cameron, as an economist, when you look at this, this balance at the moment, mm. um, where clearly um, Scott Morrison has talked about you know, the importance of alliances with like-minded liberal democracies, um, we're also caught in the, the crosshairs of, a, of an historical moment of a great power rivalry between the US and China, and China is our biggest trading partner. What are the economic imperatives to dealing with this, this moment? Look, this is, I think the, the trick is you, you distance yourself from the global superpower politics and, and you, you deal economically with both as best you can, but with enough distance as you can politically. So, for example, if we had concerns about uh, Chinese ownership of ports and, and, and that being a potential military th threat or a strategic risk, Maybe we should just own those ports. Maybe, maybe there's no good reason that it's a good investment for the Chinese government and it's not a good investment for the Australian government. So maybe we could um, be a bit more sensible in, in those economic mm. elements of the ownership of key infrastructure and take that on board, but still trade all of our resources and, and vice versa and foster those types of economic relationships. Sally. 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not. For me, the, my main thing would be, like, the, there's going to be lots of conversations when the leadership gets together. Um, I mean, I, I, the China, there probably, but I mean, Australia's doing horribly on so many things. Like, <laughs> climate change is one thing, our human rights, you know, we're failing so much when it comes to our children. Uh, the detention centre, I don't mm. understand why that still exists. Like, our human rights, you know, you know, like, all of this is failing and I'm sure that that's going to be coming up. And, you know, Scott Morrison is a savvy politician who will change the conversation when he needs to. I'm just, so I'm sure that there will be times when the China rhetoric will bounce back up. <laughs> Tam, does this, uh, does this put your mind at rest? I know when you, you asked that question, you said if someone was cynical, uh, am I right in detecting there was a bit of a cynicism in the question? Um, yes, definitely. But, but the answers... <laughs> um, I think that it's, it's good to hear that, um, that sort of like the word, um, like the G7 is not um, going to be... Um, so like distracted by mm. sort of like any um, disingenuous like you know sort of like discussions. So it's good because I, I really think that like I agree with uh, I agree with Sally that there's a lot of issues that should really be brought up and, at, and at those forums. And we're, and we're dealing with a lot of those. Now, just quickly, and we have to move on. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, just for, from WA, um, I'm, I'm hearing Mark McGowan in my, in my ear saying uh, <laughs> we need to be friends with China. And I think the, the critical thing is for us to work out a way in a mature uh, manner to have difficult conversations with other countries that doesn't uh, impact on our trading relations because Australia's prosperity will be severely affected if we keep destroying our trade relationships with China. Uh, it, and not just iron ore and, and, and mm. some of our big exports, but we import an awful lot of critical stuff. We've learnt that in COVID. We import almost all our medications, all our surgical equipment, everything we do in healthcare comes from China. Yeah, We've got to keep that it's, relationship it's going. It's an indispensable nation in economic for sure. Um, you're watching Q&A live from the Canberra Theatre. Our next question comes from Edwin Perry. Hi, this is a question for Peter Hartcher and the panel. As young Australians, we are growing up in a multipolar world dominated by the rise of China and India. The political discourse has suggested asking us, young Australians, to choose between national security and economic prosperity. Do the members of the panel believe this is a false dichotomy, and why can't we pursue both avenues? I think we've already touched on some of that, yeah. but, but Peter, I'll, I'll go to that for you because it was addressed to you. Is mm. it a, a false dichotomy? And, and, you know, I hear those questions, and I think about the world that, you know, young people are going to be entering into which is a much more volatile world where there is a return, some would say, even to a cold war. Mm. What does the future look for the young people in this room? Yeah, it is... The future... The outlook today is for Australia is a lot more serious than it was when I was your age, Edward. Uh, we weren't being confronted by a great power uh, determined to break Australia's sovereign will, and that's what this is about. The Chinese government has put trade sanctions on a bunch of Australian uh, products, as you know, whether it's wine, uh, barley, wheat, beef, timber, copper, thermal coal, the list goes on. But the problem isn't with trade. Uh, the Chinese government is not actually objecting to Australia on any trade question. How can we be so sure? Because when the Chinese embassy handed one of my colleagues, Jonathan Kearsley, at nine, a typewritten list of 14 demands on Australia, uh, which is, was last November and has been well publicised, on that list of 14 demands, how many are about trade? None. Zero. The Chinese government is not making trade demands on Australia. It is imposing trade penalties on Australia. Uh, so it's a, it's a misnomer to think that this is some sort of trade war or tit-for-tat trade dispute. It's nothing to do with trade. Uh, trade, I mean, Omar's point would be great to have rational discussion and try and iron this out. Uh, Australian ministers have been trying to phone or meet by Zoom or whatever it means their Chinese counterparts for a year now. Uh, it's difficult when the other side won't pick up the phone. Australia's being subject to a, uh, this series of trade pressures to test Australia's political will. It's not really about the economics. The economics are the pressure point. Now, you... This is a question we all have to ask ourselves. Are we prepared 
to surrender Australian sovereignty on those 14 points. Um, and it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of difficult, difficult questions uh, in return to get those exports back. Or are, we, or are we going to insist instead that our export industries figure out diversified markets and, as almost all of those sectors have done, divert those exports, sometimes at a lower price, to other countries instead? That's a choice. Uh, at the moment, both the government and opposition have made in Australia in favour of uh, retaining Australian sovereign will over the, over the dollar. But this is a question which I suspect China is going to be posing to Australia, a pressure on Australia for years to come, and I think your generation is going to have to think hard about exactly that trade-off. And Cameron, I might just get a quick comment from you just about the, the way that trade is used as a weapon, and we've already seen a trade war between China and the United States in this great power rivalry mm. and where Australia sits in that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Peter, Peter covered it pretty well, that uh, penalising and, and, and imposing tariffs on, on key, key industries, is, you know, it, it does impose costs, at least in the short term, to adjust. Um, you know, we, we can do... Does it also require diversification? Yeah, but, we, you know, we, we can do it both ways. You know, it's a, there's a big world out there of trade and, and it does take time to adjust, but uh, I guess that's going to be part of the bargain, the political bargain, uh, and, and we'll find out. Our next question comes from Maddie Leonard. In relation to the Tamil family and the enduring pressure from the community to allow the family to settle in Australia, how determined is the Australian government to use them as an example of their tough stance on asylum seekers? How far-reaching <coughs> would the politi political ramifications be if the government allowed them to settle in Australia? Sally, you raised before just these issues, didn't you, of, of, uh, of, of asylum seekers and using offshore detention. How do you see this, Mark? I don't know what the government's doing with this family. It's a joke. Like, enough is enough. And also, those two girls are Australians. Like, what, what political game are they playing at? And what's happened to our humanity that we allow this to happen? Like... Yeah. They're Australian citizens, the detention centres, you know, like, they've... It's not like a happy camping place. Like, the detention centres, they were fleeing huge risk. They took huge risks to come to Australia and they were fleeing so much issues in their own countries. Like, they wanted a better life and we've stuck them in detention centres when... Like, government's been talking about how we need more people to come and work in, you know, picking fruit and all this sort of stuff, but we're willing to spend millions over there on detention centres, millions over here doing whatever they want to do. But the political will, let them come in. Why are we resettling Australians? Like, I just don't understand why this is still a topic. And also, where is the, you know, everyone's expecting Scott Morrison to have this call and he bounces back to the Home Minister and all of this sort of stuff and they shift the blame every time, which is what they do with Aboriginal Affairs anyway. But um, the thing with all of that is, like, where is our leadership? Where is our leadership? Because it's not just Scott Morrison, it's every single minister in Parliament House there, what are they doing about it? And what is our leadership? Where is our voices for these communities? It's enough is enough. Can, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I bring you in here as someone in Sri Lankan heritage? You've worked in Sri Lanka as well. How do you see this? I think Sally said everything about yeah. the humanity. I actually, and, and that it's the right thing to do, but I think appealing to clearly our government on the basis that it's the right thing to do hasn't worked, right? That, that's a, it's a terrible thing to say, but it hasn't. But, you know, yesterday Scott Morrison gave a speech where clearly he, he has recognised the importance of multilateralism, right? That we can't go it alone, no country can go it alone. And the fact is that if you acknowledge that you need multilateralism, that means you support all of it. So you can't just expect the international community to respect a trade, a trade, international agreement, security, agriculture, fisheries, and then at the same time carve off Christmas Island for the purposes of the Refugee mm -hmm. Convention. We are, uh, we have ratified the Refugee Convention that carries 
clear responsibilities and acting like it doesn't undermines uh, the international order. Yeah. Can I just quickly... Uh, I'd like just quickly, we need to move on to our next yeah. question, but Omar, and, and then quickly from... It, from this is something that really energises doctors, and it, it's something that uh, we've written uh, about, we've, we've made public comment. I've personally spoken to the previous Home Affairs Minister. Uh, the harm that's being done to these children, whether they're refugees or not, is irrelevant. They are children. They were mm. born in this country. Uh, the idea they're not Australian is ridiculous, and the idea that uh, by allowing this uh, family to resettle in Australia that we will somehow weaken our border controls, that the boats will suddenly start coming to Australia, is also ridiculous. Yep. So as a, as a father, I, I would really like to appeal to Karen Andrews, uh, as a mother, to say, do the right thing. It is completely in the Home Affairs Minister's discretion to let this family uh, stay in Australia, and that's what she should do Jamie. immediately. Um. <laughs> I agree with what's been said, but I think the question, I forgot your name, where are you? Yeah, we, I think your sort of cynical view was the accurate one, is that it's like this because the key political decision makers want it to be like this, and it doesn't matter how many millions they need to spend locking this family up, that's how they um, show politically through the theatre of politics that they're tough on borders, and people seem to like that. So it's completely intentional. We're not going to get there by appealing to their soft spot. So. Can I, can I, can I, can I, sorry, just quickly. And that's the thing where you look at it and go, Australia, our ranking when it comes to our rights of our children is so low. Like our ranking, our humanity is lost and everyone calls us the lucky country. <laughs> what? Not I, if you're a child. Mm. <laughs> I do want to get, get to the next question because it's an important one to, to close. But, Peter, can I get a quick comment from you about when we hear from the government on this, it's about processes. It's mm. about who meets criteria. Um, it's about following that so that you have a, an orderly process. That's what we're hearing. There are yes. processes here. So what is the, what is the, the consideration <laughs> in this case? Well, the consideration was to defeat a crisis which was the boats. That was a decade ago. Boats the, came the crisis, 250 The crisis years ago, but, yeah. well and truly passed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Can we just, just 250 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the crisis was a decade ago. There's no threat from the border any longer. So that was the, that was the policy. To, to persist in this case uh, would, in my view, be performative cruelty uh, to shut this family out and this, these girls uh, who are, as Sally says, Australian citizens. The minister has total discretion. The Minister for Immigration or Home Affairs uses that ministerial discretion over immigration cases every day. Almost none of them get any coverage. Uh, it's completely within discretion. Declare this an exceptional set of circumstances. Allow them to stay. Mm. Our final question of the evening. <laughs> Our final question of the evening comes from Peter Peterson. Uh, hello, Dr. Do Dr. Roger. It's a pleasure to hear from you. Wonderful. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately for myself, I've got a bit of a problem with this uh, Medicare turnover or ch change. I've just got diagnosed last week with probable black surgery requirement. And I'm pretty uncertain about what's going to happen now. Mm. I've got, well, it's obviously going to cause distress. It's cost, so far I paid a lot of money to find out where I'm at. And I know, I don't, well, I'd like to know how much I'm going to pay in the future. Mm. It's a minefield. And I reckon there's a lot of people, a lot of people out there worried about this minefield right now. And I'd like to see something happen about it. We need a white minesweeper or something. But what do you see as a future way of giving uh, people in a dodgy situation with a changing policy every moment some sort of confidence so they get stressed and depressed and so forth? How, Peter, how are you, mate? Your, your back's not, not good. Uh, how, how are you faring? I've got, I've got a vertebrae that's causing my, uh, my feet not to feel anything at all. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and a lot of uncertainty at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and of course, I know other people in similar situations, mm. Indigenous people as well. Depression mm. is the outcome. Mm. And you see them in the River Murray, you see suicides because of that sort of stuff. I'll, I'll get Omar to comment on that. Can I just ask, are people aware at the moment, um, and I've, I've spoken to a few, few people about this who, who weren't necessarily aware about the changes that are coming to the uh, medical benefits screen, the Medicare. No? So hands up. Who, who's aware? Okay. No, no, a lot of people are unaware at the moment, Omar. That, that may be the point that you've been making about the lack of awareness and the lack mm. of consultation. 
Yeah, so look, thanks for the question, and I hope uh, our uh, world-class health system is able to, to look after you uh, when you eventually uh, get your surgery done, if that's what you need. Um, when it comes to Medicare, we've got to remember Medicare is a, an insurance system for our private sector. So public hospitals are completely separate to Medicare and public hospitals need money. They need investment and that's a, a topic that I spoke a lot about at the press club yesterday. And when it comes to the Medicare benefit schedule, it's old. Uh, it's, it's 30 years old and it needed some reform and the AMA has certainly supported that reform. What we've struggled with uh, in the last week or so is the way that government implements change. Uh, a lot of changes, a thousand, almost a thousand changes to the schedule. But the, uh, the government which, does say there was a, there's a task force, the task force is there consulted, was. there was consultations with the AMA as well. Is that not enough? Uh, doctors have been involved in the process and AMA has actually supported the process. But what we've been saying for three years is when you bring in a thousand changes, that means our, our insurance companies have to change their computer systems. Our doctors have to work out what their fees are going to be. We have to know what the insurance company is going to pay in order to be able to have a conversation with a patient about how much they might have to pay, whether there might be any out-of-pocket costs. Right now, I can't tell you what the fees are for the operations that I do with the health insurers because none of them have published them as yet. Uh, Medicare only came out uh, a little while ago with its, uh, with its information. So the good news is we have uh, been heard by government finally after three years of talking. It took it uh, getting out uh, into the media for it to be uh, resolved and the government have committed to doing better in the future for the next change and the one after that. Uh, doing better and also allowing us to review the changes that have been made to make sure that they are fit for purpose. Where mistakes have been made, and there are some mistakes, uh, they can be quickly fixed mm. uh, so that we can uh, make sure our Medicare schedule supports Australia's health into the future. Camelini, one of the things that you've raised, and we mentioned this throughout COVID as well, is the question of, of trust um, and that Medicare is a, is a question of trust. It's part of the compact, the social contract of Australia. So, when you see changes like this, and the government says, look, these changes are necessary because of the changes to procedures and some procedures becoming more effective, easier to do and so on. What does that do to that question of trust? I think it's about communication and transparency and how decisions are made. And I think that governments now know that Medicare is something you don't, you don't be seen to be touching, seen to be undermining. Mm. Uh, um, none of you are old enough, including me, but the, prior to Medicare, the most common cause of non-criminal imprisonment in Australia was unpaid medical debt. We don't want to go back to that. And a, a, good, a, a large part of our success with COVID or any other public health measure is that there has been this long relationship of reciprocity. When, when you want to go to the doctor, when you need care for your child, you know you'll get good care and you'll know you'll be able to afford it or it will be given to you. Now, that builds a relationship of trust that governments then, when they ask us to do things like stay home, like, you know, get tested, we do. And I think that doing things that aren't, aren't transparent to those who will implement those changes, aren't understood by the community, people like you, Peter, undermines the, that trust. And, you know, Medicare is something, it, it, it represents universal health care. It mm. represents equality in access to a critical uh, human right. So I think the government needs to do a better job and I hope they, I hope they hear the voices of not just yeah. Omar but much more people yeah. like Peter. And, and Peter, I'm, you know, I'm sorry that the answer, that this is sort of the answer to your question, I think, I think as Omar said, you just don't know. Um, about the yeah. costs of those procedures, Sally? I mean, I just don't want us to end up like the US. Yeah, yeah exactly. Can I just comment? I, I think it's quite interesting that these are routine updates to the medical benefits scheme that had the support of the medical community, but in, in the last week it turned into a bit of a political football. Mm -hmm. And so I find it very difficult on this question of trust. Um, we've, we've seen the Medi-Scare campaign come back, which is... You know, all this is an, is an implementation issue, an administrative issue that just needs a little bit more time, but it's become a political football. Well, so on the question of trust, you know, I think people are going to start seeing through it if that's how our politicians want to deal with health well, issues. We and, actually and, you need know, to learn how to implement reform in health and how, in fact, in government. We, we need to yeah. work out how to make change without it being, uh, uh, having a great big target uh, uh, right. on its back. Well, uh, and that's, that has been very difficult. Medicare is this sacred cow. Well, we're almost out of time. It's, it's the third rail, isn't it? I mean, you touch Medicare in an election time, it can be 
political suicide. That's right. And, you know, uh, one of the political achievements of Greg Hunt as health minister is he has neutralised health as a political issue for the Liberal Party because Labor had a strong brand advantage there. That's been pretty much neutralised. The last thing politically that this government wants to do is get people anxious about Medicare. Mm. 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 Peter, th thanks for your question. Um, good luck with, <laughs> with your back as well. I hope it... Um, I hope it gets better. That's all the time we have uh, on the show this evening. I want to thank you again for coming. Uh, please thank our panel as well, Kamalini uh, Lakuge, Omar Horshid, Sally Scales, Cameron Murray and Peter Harcher. <laughs> Wonderful questions. Really appreciated all the questions this evening. Thank you so much for that. Next week, David Spears will be in the chair. He'll bring you the program live from Melbourne, um, looking at all the issues of the week. I think we know it'll be uppermost on the agenda there, sadly, as well. The politicians will be back. Yeah? OK? No? And businesswoman and, and, uh, and philanthropist Susan Alberti and radio host Tom Elliott as well. Until then, have a good night.